Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Medicine Grand Rounds Lecture Series. Um, today we are pleased to have Dr. Farshad Farozande speak with us about spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Dr. Farozande is an Assistant Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospital, and he currently practices here as an interventional cardiologist at the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. Dr. Farazandi obtained his medical degree from Tehran University in Iran, followed by a PhD in experimental medicine at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Dr. Farazandi then went to complete his, me his residency in internal medicine at Methodist in Houston, followed by fellowship in cardiology and interventional cardiology at University of Emory. He is a passionate clinician and an avid researcher with over 80 peer-reviewed articles, abstracts, and presentations, both in translational and clinical aspects of medicine. He has received numerous prestigious awards, including the American Heart Association Postdoctoral Fellowship and the British Columbia Innovation Council Award. We are lucky to have him amongst us today. Thank you very much. Please welcome me in, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Farzande. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, so the reason, actually, I chose this topic as spontaneous coronary artery dissection is it's an entity that you may not encounter very often, but when you encounter, and I think some of you already have seen patients with this uh, when you were rounding in uh, especially cardiology uh, units or else, uh, it can be very overwhelming dealing with these very, actually, uh, usually young patients who have this condition a spontaneous coronary artery dissection and make it abbreviated as SCAD. So this first case that really prompted this uh, presentation is the lady we took care of, uh, the pleasure of taking care of a few um, months ago now. She is uh, 34 years old. She was uh, G4P3 at 38 weeks of pregnancy and went to her OB doc and uh, complained of some uh, chest pain that happened basically after meal. And going back to her history, she also reported that in um, uh, one of her actually earlier pregnancies in 2007, uh, she did have issues with chest pain. She saw cardiology. She was actually uh, suggested to get a heart catheterization done, and at that point she refused. And then she lost sort of follow-up, and then 2016, not related to any of the pregnancies, she had an episode of chest pain, came to the ED, had positive troponin, at 0.25, some uh, non-specific uh, T changes on the EKG. They did an echocardiogram and also they did a coronary CTA, and they didn't find much. It uh, looked pretty okay. And uh, after that, she didn't follow again with uh, cardiology she, uh, or was put on any medication for that purpose. Basically, two episodes of uh, kind of chest pain uh, prior to this one. And now for this chest pain, she was sent from her OB doc office kind of Friday afternoon uh, to the ED here at uh, UHCMC. This was her EKG at the presentation. And uh, as you can uh, appreciate, there's really no ST elevation, but she does have some uh, T changes, T inversions, uh, which going back to the old EKG, she did have it in the past too. And this uh, basically didn't have any dynamic changes in the repeat EKGs. But her first troponin actually came back at 2.1, and uh, really soon, in about an hour, the repeat was very high at 22.38. Um, our actually astute fellow bedside echo uh, uh, that he did uh, showed gross and normal cardiac function. The patient was transferred to the cardiac ICU, and then uh, Saturday morning, her troponin still was you know, going up to 42. We had her on low-dose nitroglycerin. We had her on some heparin drip. Uh, basically ACS treatment, and uh, she was chest pain free at the time. OB actually evaluated the patient. She did uh, have a transverse kind of situation with the fetus, and uh, they said that she needs to get cesarean section um, really soon. Otherwise, there's going to be some jeopardy of the uh, fetus here. So, uh, but we had our medication. We uh, monitored her, again, remain chest pain free, <clears throat> and we trended the troponin, which has started actually to come down, so this is Sunday morning, troponin was 35.2, and uh, really OB is saying that we need to go and take this baby out. So this is when actually we put everybody that we could think of together to come up with the best decision uh, for this patient. From uh, her history, and you'll see why I'm saying that, 
Uh, it sounded like this patient was suffering from a spontaneous coronary artery dissection, even without looking at the angiogram. But uh, that was a really you know, a strong uh, presumptive diagnosis we had at the time. And really the question was, was uh, what to do with this patient? So again, we um, put the heart team together, and you know about heart team. So really, when you have a complex situation, um, let's say involving a severe aortic stenosis, multivessel coronary artery disease, you, um, I think the best course of treatment and really emphasized on most of cardiology guidelines now is to put intervention cardiologists, general cardiologists, surgeon, um, if need be, other members of the team all together, of course, talk with the patient and family and make this hard team approach to come up really with the best decision. And most of the time, it is really a case-based uh, decision that you have to make. Here, of course, we had the tweak of adding OB uh, to the mix of doctors that we had to put together on a Sunday morning. So we had the cardiac surgeon also on board and the OB and high risk basically uh, fetal. And so their decision, our decision actually was go ahead and do a coronary angiogram, which by itself, even in the setting of um, a spontaneous coronary dissection, is not a very high risk procedure to do, really uh, to basically know the anatomy of this patient, see if it is truly a spontaneous coronary artery dissection or not. So we took him to the lab, you already see the this area uh, of basically lucency, uh, you know, some uh, darkest spot, and then the lucency in the, this is the LAD coming in front of the heart in this cranial view. Uh, so this was the tier of the basically coronary artery, uh, and uh, you again see it in this view, you know, and then we look at the right coronary artery, that looked okay. So really what this patient was suffering from was a, a SCAD in proximal LAD. So what to do with this is what uh, is the thing that we are going to talk right now. So in most cases, uh, if you have a patient with acute coronary syndrome, you see a lesion, especially proxial AD, it's pretty straightforward that you have to revascularize the patient. Most of the time, if it's just one lesion like this, you go ahead and put a stent. If you are dealing with multiple cell disease, um, there are times that surgery is a better option. But of course, you'll see in this actually patient population, uh, is one of those that sometimes uh, doing less is actually better for the patient. Uh, so we did this. We basically um, got the surgical uh, CT surgery basically all ready, have our surgeon to be on the standby, perfusions on the standby, and have the OBGYN actually be ready to do the cesarean section while everybody else, including us, sitting in the control room and ready basically to uh, do uh, kind of an emergency bypass surgery if the patient has any hemodynamic compromise because of the C-section. Uh, but, you know, fortunately this uh, patient was able to deliver her baby. Um, this was, of course, this picture, but uh, everything went very well. Uh, she didn't have any actual issues post-surgery. She was discharged in a few days. Troponin came down. Basically, we didn't treat that uh, really bad-looking lesion with any revascularization option. And I know she's out actually uh, couple of months now was seen in follow-up, doing great, actually. So in contrast, this is a lady I took care of when I was a fellow, actually, back in Emory. And this is another, basically, part of this spectrum of uh, condition you can see. A 31-year-old lady, uh, her past medical history was significant for tobacco abuse, basically. She was sent to us about nine days after she had her baby delivered, uh, post having a V-fib arrest in an outside hospital. So what happened was that basically one morning she was doing uh, breastfeeding to her baby. Suddenly there were burning chest pain, some you know heartburn. Went to the uh, emergency by the EMS. She was uh, quickly found to be unresponsive and uh, was in a V-fib. She was resuscitated successfully, defibrillated. Uh, again, had another episode of VTVF in the ED. Eventually was intubated and rescued with another defibrillation. Her EKG showed clear anterior ST elevations, uh, basically reciprocal inferior ST depressions. She was loaded with aspirin and Plavix, and she underwent actually emergency heart catheterization. So this is what she had. These are the steel frames. So uh, this is basically the OM. It was a long tubular, basically narrowing, also another narrowing here. And then um, you see this is her LAD, another actually long lesion, hazy in LAD, diagonal lesion. So basically what she had, she had uh, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection in multi of the coronary arteries, 
Her EF was low at 25%. They put a balloon pump, and they, they lifted the patient to us, which was the, basically the academic center for the system. So what we did, you know, monitor her, her troponin peaked at 155. Uh, we supported her with a uh, balloon pump, some inotrope, and her chest pain resolved. Hemodynamics actually improved. And um, she was doing great for about a day and a half, and then she started having chest pain again. And again, you know, you see this in the um, natural history of this disease, the recurrence, that, that's something that you really need to watch. So her troponin rise, we had a discussion, we decided to take the patient back to the cat lab to take another look, and now you see this is the left main coronary artery, and now she has a dissection in left main. So now we are dealing with the patient who has some dynamic compromise, ongoing chest pain, and dissection of left main. And uh, really, as you'll see again in the slide I'll show, uh, one of the best options for these patients is to do bypass surgery. So that's what we did for this patient. It happened to be a Friday afternoon, and uh, so actually I went to the OR and took these pictures and I scrubbed it a little bit uh, during this case. Uh, so these are all the dissected arteries that they found in the OM and also in the LAD. So she got basically two vessel vein graft bypass, and uh, she did very actually well after this. So she was excavated shortly after um, EF actually recovered to good extent, and again she was seen in follow-up doing great. So very very sick actually lady, just a few days after having her. Uh, first baby and going through this. Uh, so you can imagine how much stress she went through. But now that you saw kind of two end of this spectrum, um, you know, the patient that was successfully managed medically versus the patient that underwent uh, coronary artery <coughs> bypass grafting, both of them young for the very similar basic situation. So how could we come up with this decision in this very actually tough uh, patient population? So what a SCAD is, basically, is a non-traumatic, non-iatrogenic, non-atrosclerotic separation of the walls of the artery. So this, you know that each artery has three different walls, intima, media, adventitia, and separation of any of these two basically can let the blood to go inside and cause basically a hematoma in the wall of the artery, and that basically creates a false lumen, and that false lumen can jeopardize the flow in the true lumen of the artery. And if it becomes so severe, it can cause complete occlusion. Uh, so how this happens? I mean, there are at least a few mechanisms that have been described that why some people they get this, uh, or, or at least how this happens. So one thing is, you know, the artery uh, walls, especially in medium to large size arteries, they have vasovasorum, which are these tiny bit, basically arteries that are feeding the actual artery and if they actually burst for any reason, they can actually cause hematoma, uh, basically subintimal hematoma, and that can actually end up uh, causing a scab. The other theory is if you have a little tear in the intima, then the blood can go in from the true lumen to the subintimal space, cause hematoma here, and basically intima tear hypothesis, which is something we see or we feel it is the most common type, but as a matter of fact now, we, uh, as you'll see, we do more intervascular imaging. So we see the third basic situation, which is just the intramural hematoma to form, either because of vasovasorum or just out of blue. And then it can actually press the uh, intima and cause a tear. So basically, uh, this is called a medial hemorrhage that can cause uh, basically a tear, so reverse intimal rupture. So any of these three actually uh, pathophysiology can lead to a scab. Which one is for each patient? Sometimes you can guess, sometimes not. The epidemiology, as we already kind of alluded to, this is a patient condition that you see more often in younger individuals, and the real true prevalence is not very well known, and most of the time the reason is it has been vastly underdiagnosed. Uh, the gold standard uh, is doing a coronary angiogram. Really, in short of that, there are other ways to diagnose it, like coronary CTA right now, but Really, uh, sometimes uh, it can be challenging in those non-invasive tests to make the initial diagnosis. They are great to be used for follow-up purposes to see if the vessel has healed up, but for initial diagnosis, really coronary angiogram is the way to go. So in the previous reports, you know, it has been reported up to, you know, 1.1%. In the newer studies that we used, uh, or especially in Japan, they use a lot of optical coherent tomography, which is 
a type of intravascular imaging that we do in the cath lab more and more these days. You can diagnose this cat up to 4% of the patient who present with acute coronary syndrome. Um, and basically, there are uh, places um, like in Japan, like in uh, Vancouver, Dr. Sa has the uh, largest actually registry. They are diagnosed up to 4% of patients with ACS to have a scat. Um, so it is, again, very underappreciated uh, situation. This is the first reported case of a SCAD uh, that was, you know, many, many, many years ago. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, you can see and <laughs> read this font. It's very small. But kind of an interesting way of presenting a case report back then. The patient had a good meal, uh, including fried fish and chips, and, uh, and then had retching and vomiting, ended up having a, a sending aorta uh, dissection, and that actually extended to the right coronary artery, uh, which is not very common but can happen. And that was felt to be completely spontaneous. So this is actually known as the first case of a SCAD reported in literature, at least. But if you are dealing with young ladies and they have acute coronary syndrome, and still they can get typical atherosclerotic type ACS, but about, you know, a third or uh, almost a half, again, depending on which patient population and how aggressive you look for the diagnosis, they can have actually a SCAD. Again, the Canadian registry, um, they do report it even higher than the other places. Um, and then uh, if it is a pregnancy-related acute coronary syndrome, meaning toward the end of the uh, pregnancy or the first few weeks or first couple of months after pregnancy, it can be up to 43% of the ACS cause uh, to be due to a scab. So it is not as rare of an entity as we may think of. We just don't probably think of it, and like anything else in medicine, you don't think of it, you are not going to diagnose it. Hopefully not from today. So a scat affects women more than 90% of cases, and most of them are young, actually, people or, you know, for latest middle age. And so these are, you know, some of the series that they put patients with a scat together. And as you can see, the age group is kind of on the younger age group. I mean, nowadays, being a cardiologist, I see somebody who is like 60, I call them actually young. So most of our patients are 70 and, uh, you know, 80, and, you know, 70 is kind of a new middle age now. So for us, you know, seeing a 40-year-old uh, with this situation, that's like teenaging uh, year, basically. But what is important and what I actually brought this topic to present, why it is not as common, is really, you know, the gravity of the situation. You are dealing with a young person who probably just had baby or is going to have a baby, like the case we had, and they are going through basically a very, very tough situation to make decision for. And as a matter of fact, the maternal mortality in the U.S., despite all other, in contrast to other countries, is actually on the rise. And acute coronary syndrome of different types uh, is one of the reasons, actually. And if you look at the reason for acute MI related to pregnancy, SCAD basically is the top, actually, um, cause. You can, again, get the usual atherosclerosis. You can get uh, blood uh, clot and thrombus from different sources, uh, like embolic showering and so forth, and spasm, like a tubo. So different, you know, scenarios cause, cause ACS, but uh, the SCAD is, of course, the most common type. And why pregnancy put people at high risk for a SCAD? You know, the short answer, we don't know why exactly. There are theories, and some of them, they make sense. Like there are changes in the elasticity uh, of the vessels. There's more, actually, matrix metalloproteinases uh, because of the progesterone release. There's actually changes on the shear stress and, uh, you know, vascular tension. And if somebody has, especially the media for it, uh, this might be a stress time uh, that actually can actually cause the rupture in the vessel and, uh, and end up actually causing this for the patient. Again, there are different theories, relaxing, progesterone, estrogen, all of them contributed. We don't know exactly why, though. There are a lot of studies going on. But one thing is most of the SCAD patients um, around time of pregnancy happens actually after delivery. And it happens really the first week uh, is the highest prevalence. The first few weeks is the highest, but the first week in showing an orange share is actually the highest risk. So if really, please, you have a patient toward the end of pregnancy, first few weeks, even first few months, you are complaining of chest pain, even heartburn, very atypical. We had a talk with our uh, student residents and fellows in the CIC today that, you know, about how typical is the pain for, uh, to call it an acute coronary syndrome kind of pain. Many patients, even with a STEMI, they don't present with typical symptoms. That's like crushing chest pain, you know, 
um, elephants sitting on chests and uh, levy sign, all those things, they don't happen very often, honestly, especially if you are uh, dealing with older population or you are dealing with ladies. So I've seen patients with, you know, headache and they had a C elevation and might be, um, being honest, that, that was the presentation to the ED. So be very, very hypervigilant. If you see any of those, you know, doing an EKG, very, very non-invasive test, no radiation, no harm, uh, could save the patient actually and her family uh, a lot of actually misery. And this condition can also happen in men. It's not, you know, particular and um, in women, uh, especially, you know, a lot of intense exercise, isometric exertion, very heavy lifting, you know, in weight lifters has been shown. Not just dissection in coronaries, even dissection in carotid arteries and other places have been reported. Having said that, it's much less common in men. And there are some studies showing that there might be some familial correlation and these are like giving us some clue, maybe there are some genes putting people at higher risk for a SCAD. Uh, again, you know, this is probably the best paper I could find to, you know, discuss that. They reported a few families, like five families that they had, you know, multiple siblings. So one of them was twin. Um, you know, they had both they had a SCAD. But again, it's not as strongly uh, yet known if there's a specific gene actually causing this SCAD or not. So these are different type of a SCAD, an angiogram. So, this type is the type one SCAD, which is the more actually typical one. And I think most people are like cardiologists, intervention cardiologists, they're very, very you know, familiar on how to diagnose this one. This is the patient I just presented, the first one. Um, she did have basically this type of SCAD. You have a lucency and you see basically tears, so there's uh, subintimal hematoma, and that's what you see. The other type is basically the long uh, tubular narrowing in the artery that both sides and the rest of the arteries are pretty normal. So it's despite, you know, when you see arterial sclerosis, especially if you see a long lesion arterial sclerosis, you usually see something else going on in the other arteries, not necessarily an obstructive disease, uh, but uh, with a long lesion just purely affecting one artery is less common. And again, in the right scenario, that should tip you to, toward actually diagnosing type two uh, SCAD. So this long diffuse and a smooth narrowing with two basically normal, healthy uh, proximal and distal edge. And then there's this even more difficult type, type three, which is a focal tubular stenosis. For what's worth, an angiogram, which uh, looks like exactly a typical atherosclerotic lesion. The only way you know for sure if it is a SCAD or is it atherosclerosis is to do intravascular imaging of one type or the other. So one of them is doing optical coherent tomography, or OCT, uh, which basically we put a wire down the artery, and we put this catheter, which basically uh, look at inside the artery by the light. So we inject contrast. The contrast basically uh, put the blood away and clears the lumen for a second. And then with the light, you can see the um, wall of the artery. You can see the intima. You can see if they have a hematoma like this side. You can see that. So you can actually make a diagnosis of uh, type 3 SCAD, if you cannot do it on the angiogram uh, using OCT, or you can do intravascular imaging, so using ultrasound. Um, so the good thing, you don't need contrast here, and also the, uh, the other good thing is you, um, the penetration of the ultrasound is going to be higher than the light, so you can see even beyond, um, basically, media, you can see the adventitia. The overall resolution for OCT is better than IVUS. Uh, but again, there's a little bit, you know, upside uh, for each and downside for each. Like for OCT, you have to inject contrast, and the concern is that if you have a tear in the artery and you are injecting contrast, so that hydraulic pressure that can propagate the dissection and make things worse. So that's why using OCT is a little bit, you know, riskier to some extent than I was for this purpose. And any of them can be risky because in order to do them, you have to put a wire in the artery and if you are not careful enough or you are not lucky, and uh, my little experience for many things, uh, especially in our field, you have to be good and you have to be lucky. So if you are neither and you put the wire in the false lumen um, by mistake, you can propagate the dissection by just putting your wire there, and everything else from that point is going to be really hard to deal with. So again, these are the tools in CATLAB available to us if there's a concern or question. Um, if there's no question, like the patient we had, there's no reason to put the wire down and do all this. So, again, this is another 
case showing that really both of these tools are really good. If you look at this by itself, it's really hard to make a diagnosis of a SCAD, but if you do, let's say here, OCT, you can nice to see the tear, you can see the basically hematoma here, or in the IVUS, you can also see the tear, you can see the hematoma, so you can make a diagnosis. Um, this is basically a, a spontaneous coronary dissection. Again, the patient you know, presentation, being a young uh, lady uh, around time of pregnancy and delivery, that helps a lot too. Again, uh, looking more at the IVUS, so uh, showing the similar actually idea, these are the tools that, you know, you know, even if you don't want to do cardiology, you hear a lot of them be used these days. Unfortunately, in the U.S., I think the average uh, interventionalist uses uh, IVUS or OCT less than 10% uh, of their cases. Some places have picked up to 15, but in Europe, um, they're actually doing above 50%. And, uh, you know, beside this topic, it is really a good tool to be used to see when we put a stent, how well the stent has been, uh, stent has been expanded and opposed to the vessel wall, helps us to size the stent correctly and precisely and just, you know, move beyond just uh, usual angiogram, which is, in many cases is good, but it might not be sufficient. So, again, just beautifully showing how OCT can help to see the false lumen, and this is the true lumen. So this is the longitudinal view that will be created by the machine when you're done with your OCT. Again, I kind of alluded to what are the advantages and disadvantages of using, actually, any of these tools to further make diagnosis in places that you have questions. So clinical presentation of patients with a scalp, again, many of them, they present with chest pain or at least chest pain is component of the presentation. But again, patients could present with headache, with fatigue, with syncope. And in my second case, from my fellowship time, presented eventually with VTV and VF. Of course, had some heartburn and chest pain initially. So really, again, high, basically, um, uh, being very vigilant, actually, and, um, and high, basically, um, uh, rate for doing EKGs in any questionable cases will save you and the patient a lot of misery. And then again, to make the diagnosis as we talked, if it's type 1 SCAD, it's very easy to diagnose most of the time. Even without injecting the contrast in our face case, you could see the haziness and that tips you over that this is a SCAD type 1. Type 2 also is not very difficult to diagnose. And again, type 3, that's the one mimics atherosclerosis. In Vancouver series, actually, they have a lot of a SCAD. It's not that there's a prevalence of a SCAD if you migrate to Canada or they have a gene for it. It's just they look for it more, and they do more intravascular imaging, so they pick up more cases. So this is their registry, actually, and uh, they're, they're showing, you know, they have a lot of type 2. Um, in usual practice, you see probably type 1 more, but, again, type 2 is something that we have to look for as well. And these are the arches that can be involved. So it's kind of a small, but LAD probably is the most common one. Then the uh, optus marginal branches can be involved. But to my experience, almost any artery of the heart can be involved in a SCAD. So uh, just look for it. And uh, there, are, uh, there are situations that you have multi-vessel SCAD, as the second case I presented. And keep in your mind, there's always you know, a list of differential diagnoses. We are dealing with you know, patient population that are becoming more obese more prevalence of diabetes, more prevalence of, you know, hypertension, not very well treated, and all that. So really seeing atherosclerotic lesion causing ACS, even in a 40-year-old person, is not quite uncommon. I had a patient, I did a STEMI PCI on her about now two months ago. She was 42 at the time I did her case, but she had her first heart attack when she was 25. Uh, and then second heart attack when she was 33, and she came back with the 40, at 42 with the third one. And of course, guess what? She's still smoking. So um, you see a lot of this patient when you go to real world. So look always, you know, I don't call a SCAD a zebra. It's not quite a zebra if you are looking for the right patient population. But again, more common things being more common, you can also deal with atherosclerotic lesions even in younger individuals. A spasm, it can be a very well-known cause for basically ACS. Um, again, younger individuals, uh, women actually a little bit more uh, tendency, but also in patient population uh, who are getting chemotherapy, especially 5-FU. We just had a patient about two, three weeks ago. He came to the ED, clear acceleration, MI on EKG, chest pain, 
And for what's worth, I mean, she, he was, uh, I think, close to 70, uh, just finished the chemo round, and he didn't know because his chemo was at Cleveland Clinic. We didn't have the detail uh, of what chemo he got. So we took him to the lab. He did have some atherosclerosis, but nothing to cause a complete blockage in the STEMI. And uh, I went back and figured out his medication, and he got actually uh, full FOX, and part of it was 5-FU. So he had probably coronary spasm that was relieved. In questionable cases, there's no way. You have to take a patient to the cath lab, take a look. Um, Takatsubo, of course, as you're familiar with, you can have a whole talk about this. Coronary embolism, especially patients with AFib, they can get coronary embolism. Other patients, too, um, that can actually cause ACS. And there's this term, minoca. You hear it more if you keep going to ACC meetings, especially the one uh, on women's health. There's more and more prevalence, I don't know why, of this entity of patients who have clear-cut MI, either with troponin or with also uh, positive EKGs uh, for C elevations, and we do the CAT, and really there's no obstruction, and we call them MI with non-obstructive coronary disease or minuca. And again, that uh, can be a talk on its own. I don't think we know a whole lot about it, though. Uh, predisposing factors. One thing that, you know, is kind of new in the field of SCAT for the last few years is uh, the relationship of fibromuscular dysplasia in SCAT. And it's becoming more and more actually known that people with fibromuscular dysplasia, they have high risk to have basically a SCAT. And I'll talk about it a little bit more in the next slides. And other things as, as uh, we alluded to, uh, the pregnancy relationship because of all the changes, Connective tissue disorders, Marfan and all that, again, just because they can actually change the architecture of the vessels, they can put patients at high risk uh, for tear. Any systemic inflammations, like any other, uh, you know, inflammatory situation can put patients at high risk for SCAS. Uh, hormonal therapy, while it hasn't been, you know, uh, shown 100% they can cause the SCAS, there are some, again, uh, presumptive relationship between hormones and the level of MMPs and, you know, elasticity of the vessels and all that. Coronary spasm and, all, uh, and those things. So, again, relationship between FMD and SCAD is something that we are learning more and more as we are looking for it more and more. Um, it, and it, there are series, actually, that they have actually reported a high number of FM, uh, uh, FMD in patients with SCAD. And the uh, most, actually, pharmacological dysplasia seen in renal arteries, actually, in, in this patient population, but also it can happen in iliac arteries, it can happen in uh, arteries going to the brain and also several aneurysms. So really the prevalence can be high depending on uh, which cohort you are looking at. Uh, Mayo Mayo Clinic, they are of course getting a lot of referral, any questionable cases, they do a lot of angiograms, so they probably have very high actually prevalence. Uh, about 50% of the SCAT patients, they also have FMD, but I think there's a lot of referral bias there. Uh, Vancouver, again, registry, which is the biggest that we have in the world, pretty much. So what they do, uh, they screen for the renal and iliac artery FMD while they are doing the angiogram uh, for the coronaries, and then they get a CTA uh, of the head and neck uh, to basically look uh, for any pharmacological dysplasia changes. And coronary FMD is a kind of a nice, interesting you know, phenomenon that has been described lately that, you know, depending, again, what you define as uh, FMD, if you define just coronary tortuosity, pretty much in all patients with this CAD, you see some coronary tortuosity higher than what you see in other people. If you are looking at dilation and ectasia, a bit more than half percent, any irregularity or stenosis, you know, different percentage. So, again, coronary FMD has been postulated also to be one of the reasons for people to get this CAD. And this is actually what uh, pharmacological dysplasia looks like in, in terms of histopathology. So most of them, you get medial pharmacological dysplasia, meaning this media actually, part you remember, you have intima, media, adventitia, so you get hyperplasia in the media, that's above 90%, but also you can get pre-adventitia fibrosis, which is this type here, and also you can get intima fibroplasia. Um, so histopathologically, you can have three different FMDs. But looking at the artery itself, either you can get this beading pattern, multifocal FMD, which, uh, remember, you're more likely going to get this tested when you're doing your ABIM because it's a very common thing to be tested for uh, FMDs, especially in renal arteries, this beading pattern. And um, really the good thing about it is 
despite other type of stenosis where you have probably to put a stent to fix them, with the FMD, you just do blown angioplasty and you cure it. Uh, so the, this goes away for good uh, in most patients undergoing this uh, angioplasty. And also you can get a focal uh, FMD, which again is less common, um, but uh, more likely uh, you need to do a little bit intravascular imaging to make the diagnosis. So what is the management of a scat? Now we talk all about the different type, if it's immunology, how to diagnose, and you know you suck up a lot of cases. So how could you make the decision of not doing anything for the first case and rush the second case to the bypass, and that was a Friday evening? So that's like in a more emergent fashion. So how can we come up with those decisions? So first of all, we should appreciate and realize we are talking about a spectrum of presentation in these patients. So they can have a small MI, no more chest pain, doing okay, and be very stable. So in Our Lady, honestly, with the presumptive diagnosis of a SCAD, I was kind of okay with doing the angiogram so we can make a diagnosis like 100%, although pre-test probability was above 90%. Uh, but even doing anything for that, you know, we were not really interested to do anything because her chest pain was gone, her throat point was coming down, and her EF was normal. So if it wasn't because of the need for delivery of the baby in that situation, I think we would just monitor that patient in cardiac ICU probably for a few more days, maybe a few more days on telemetry unit, put her on some good medications and let her go home, and then reevaluate her later on. But because, you know, she had to deliver the baby, we were worried about hemodynamic changes and the stress to the body. We said maybe that tear is going to get worse and uh, would be a need for urgent bypass, and the best is like always. Have, uh, you know, ask for help and have people ready to go um, and be a little bit more proactive rather than be reactive. So if bad things happen, at least you have resources to take care of. So again, it's this kind of a patient is a stable chest pain free, small MI. Usually you leave them alone, but remember, monitor them a few days in the hospital. Don't let them go home really quickly because as you saw in my second case, the, it's a dynamic situation and the patient can get better early like, you know, and then like a honeymoon situation, and then it gets worse over uh, next thing you know. A large MI ongoing chest pain, these are the patients that, you know, you have to define the anatomy and decide the body vascularization, whether or PCI or bypass. And a stable shock patient, those are the tough ones. Like the patient we had, um, you, know, you have to put sometimes some dynamic support. And there are smaller studies now showing that, you know, probably impelled hemodynamic support, which probably have seen, uh, is a little bit better than balloon pump, um, you know, in the small series that has been shown, it worked better. And there's some theory behind it. With the balloon pump, you increase your diastolic pressure and coronary flow. There's a little bit of concern with doing that. You can propagate dissection. With impella, you don't do that. So, again, there's a little bit of advantage of doing impella if you need uh, cardiogenic shock. Again, not a big study, so still my uh, thinking is probably you have to make a case-by-case -case decision. Cardiac arrest, and of course it can, you know, kill the patient. I mean, this is one of the known cause of pregnancy-related death. So, again, the patients who are high risk for death, cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, low EF, left main dissection, this happened in about 7.6% of patients in the Canadian SCAD registry. Now I think they enrolled more than 400 patients over a few years. So it's not very common to get to the end of the spectrum, but almost one out of 10 patients will get there. So if you look at the natural history of these patients, um, most of them, again, female, most of them, they had LAD at least be involved. Um, and the good thing is, you know, the rule of thumb for these arches is that they're going to heal up. So it's not as a surgically plaque. It's not a fixed, basically, a stenosis. It's a dynamic tear, and when the cementimal hematoma gets absorbed, the intima usually goes back to where it belongs, and the vessel uh, heals up. So that's why we advocate for conservative management early on, uh, and you don't hear that many conservative management from interventionalists, but this is definitely one of those, um, that you have to be, you know, sometimes be careful of not doing things. I've seen patients um, that they were taken to the cath lab prematurely with this condition. They put the wire down in the false lumen, and the game is over. You have to put metal, you know, stents all through the artery in a young patient, and that usually is not a good thing to do. 
And sometimes, you know, they, uh, so this SCAD actually came and registry. They did angiogram. Part of it was, you know, they're doing a lot of uh, research. And again, many of these patients, they healed up in about 95% in about a month's time. So really, again, uh, if the patient is stable, just conservative management monitor. If the patient is not stable, especially if left man is involved, um, then think about, you know, bypass surgery. And uh, if the patient has ongoing, you know, chest pain and dynamic compromise, PCI or cabbage, uh, again, very difficult to, uh, decision to make sometimes for each patient. It's a little bit more detail. I don't want to bore you about details of how to do PCI. If you have to do PCI in these patients, I will leave that uh, if I do a talk for our intervention colleagues. But there are specific things you have to consider when you are doing PCI on these patients, which is a little bit different from the regular angioplasty that we do. Again, in the Canadian registry, uh, you know, most patients, they got conservative treatment, and they did find very few of them uh, basically end up needing revascularization. In terms of what uh, medications these patients should be on, even this is a more challenging decision to make. So you are dealing with a subentimal hematoma in one part, um, and then you are talking about which blood thinner should I put the patient on. You know, they have acute coronary syndrome, and for most acute coronary syndrome, I mean, you have to put the patients on heparin, you know, dual antibiotic therapy, even if you don't put a stent. So these patients are tough to make decisions for. Um, so I think everybody agrees that these patients, even if you don't do a stent, if you do a stent, you are committed. You have to put dual antibiotic therapy to keep the stent open. But if you don't put a stent, you have to put the patient at least on baby aspirin. And remember, I mean, just as a side note, between 325 and 81, there's really no big difference except that there's higher risk for bleeding with 325. So there are very, very few niche uh, usages for 325. One is the patient who is just presenting with an acute coronary syndrome. So those are the patients that get 325 or you know, four of the baby aspirin. Otherwise, really, baby aspirin has been shown in multiple studies is uh, as good as uh, 325 in terms of the ischemic prevention uh, without the increased risk of bleeding. So you put patients on baby aspirin, beta blocker, again, has been suggested by many people, is a good thing to do, decrease the shear stress, uh, get the heart rate lower. But, you know, how long to do Plavix? Nobody knows. If they benefit from AC inhibitor, of course, if the LV dysfunction is present, yes, like any other heart failure patient uh, with low EF. But if uh, not, is not actually well studied. Statins, if they have high cholesterol to begin with, has been advocated. Very, very, very tiny study from Mayo Clinic. Statins, in an observational uh, study, actually uh, increase the harm to this patient population. Again, something to consider, but I don't know why. No, they don't know why, but uh, again, if the cholesterol is high, they benefit from a statin. Remember, pathophysiology is different. So that means, you know, thinking and how to make decisions and medications is going to be different. You can't just use the same uh, model of usual ACS for this patient population. Nice calcium channel blocker, especially if they have chest pain, vasospasm, are good things to do. Uh, and in terms of heparin, I didn't list it here. Most people, they try not to talk about it, but I ask people who are doing, dealing a lot with the SCAD, so they say if they diagnose the patient with the SCAD in the cat lab, they stop the heparin. So it's okay to do it until you don't know exactly if it's a SCAD, but if you diagnose the SCAD, the best is to stop heparin just because, again, you are dealing with intramural hematoma. And theoretically, um, if you put the patient on heparin and give them asthma and all that, you can make the hematoma worse. Is it true or not? No randomized clinical trial. So again, another area that if someone is really interested to put a registry together um, and do a small study at least would be good to do. And PCI outcome, the other reason not to jump on and uh, do PCI in this patient is really the PCI outcome is not so great. So even, you know, these patients uh, in these registries, presumably, you know, good operators, you know, they're doing, you know, the scholarship activity and uh, publishing, the stent thrombosis rate was 5 to 6%. That's actually very high. Nowadays, our stent thrombosis rate for usual PCI is more close to 0.5%. Um, you know, so that means it's like 10 times at least higher in the SCAD population, the stent thrombosis rate. I remember, these are young patients, so they get a stent thrombosis, 
you have to put second and then just a vicious cycle. So uh, no rush to do PCI unless you really have to. <clears throat> Another reason not to do PCI is the risk of catheter-induced uh, dissection. So if any of you is interested and later on want to do research on the SCAD and you go to the ICD-9 codes and all that, uh, another common thing that sometimes happens is the guide catheter or diagnostic catheter going in and cause dissection of the artery. And those, they get coded as corner dissection. But those are not what we are talking about today. Those are different entity. Most of them we have to put a stand and fix. But um, the spontaneous corner artery dissection that we are talking about today, um, they don't need PCI in all cases. And actually doing PCI can put the patient also at the risk for catheter-induced dissection. Again, we talk about wiring and how it can be challenging. So just a couple of minutes on if you send a patient for bypass, what kind of bypass you do, vein grafts, lima, which is arterial graft, which we use in most patients that they go for bypass, at least for the LAD, uh, nobody knows. Again, not really a study which uh, type of bypass graft do, to do, but for our patient, um, um, we actually decided to do vein graft uh, because of two theoretical, again, reasons. One of them was that, again, the, remember, the natural history of this disease is healing. So even if you put a bypass graft to get the patient out from the acute setting, this native vessel is going to heal up in about you know, a month, two months, three months. And usually when the vessel heals up and you have a bypass graft attached to that graft, the flow in the graft is going to be a slow day slowing down and the graph is going to close up, becomes athletic and is going to close up. Um, so really doing the vein grafts in this patient population is kind of a bridge to healing of the native coronary artery. And so it makes a little bit more sense than using the lima graft of, of somebody who is young and may eventually need that lima graft later on for a true atherosclerotic lesion. And the other theoretical reason was that lima graft has a higher pressure in it and again, there's a small risk to propagate the dissection because of hydraulic pressure. Again, nobody has shown which one is better, but uh, you know, these are things to keep in mind. Uh, and this patient population, again, just the younger, you do a good job. Mortality rate is good, but as I said, pa graft patency is poor, and the reason behind it is native vessels heals up. Like if you see a patient that goes for bypass surgery, not because of a scar, just uh, usual coronary artery disease, and uh, graft actually closes up. One of the reasons that can happen is that they grafted a, an artery that didn't need to be grafted to begin with. Like there was enough flow in that artery and you grafted it and you had a low flow in the graft, so the graft will go down. So this is what's gonna happen in these patients to their grafts eventually. Uh, so again, it's a bridge uh, basically to recovery uh, for these patients. Um, uh, other things, so exercise, of course, you know, there's a little bit of concern by doing, you know, intense exercise activity, increasing shear stress. Uh, you can actually make uh, things worse in patients where they had a scat. So really what uh, they came up with, you know, because of many advantages of exercise, and any patient who gets a stand or they have MI, I send them for cardiac rehab, and most of them they go through and they love it. I mean, they get their strength back for one thing, and the second, they get their confidence back of being able to do exercise. Most people after a heart attack or a stent, they get so scared that they don't do much just because they are worried about having another heart attack. But if you put them through a cardiac rehab program with a monitoring, basically, situation, um, they do very well. So in Canada, actually, now uh, they came up with this kind of modified rehab program where they have a little bit lower intensity exercise program um, to basically deal with the patient with the SCAD, a little bit higher, uh, lower actually heart rate goal, lower basically intensity, lower blood pressure, so that you know the patient, they don't get to the theoretical uh, risk of uh, having another episode of a SCAD. So really, I mean, the recommendation is to get the patients back to a sport, but really probably a, to a low to moderate intensity exercise. Uh, what about pregnancy after a scat? Somebody had a scat, should they get pregnant again or not? Bottom line, no biggest studies, but um, if you ask many people who are, you know, 
expert in the field of SCAD because of the recurrent, actually, risk of the SCAD, and again, pregnancy being one of the contributors, most of you would say probably no. Uh, so the, you know, suggestion is if the patient, you know, especially had already one baby or my actually patient, this was her fourth actually kid, uh, the best is to undergo basic uh, sterilization procedure or at least get something more reliable like an IUD, um, basically, so that they don't get pregnant anymore or uh, basically, anyway, take care of this. Um, there are patients with recurrent SCAD after recurrent pregnancy. So, again, not exactly known, but something to keep in mind to advise patients about. So this is when I was a fellow, actually, back in Emory. Um, you know, because of that patient, you know, it was a very um, kind of big experience for us. So I said, let's go back and put together um, the, you know, ex experience at Emory, how this has been evolved over time. So going back to 97 all the way to 2015, we gathered, you know, a good number of patients who had the SCAD. And remember, these patients at Emory, pretty much all of them, they were diagnosed or at least had a presumptive diagnosis of a SCAD, and they were very sick coming in from outside hospital and referred to us. Really probably the other end of the spectrum that we were dealing with. And uh, many of them actually they underwent bypass surgery and, uh, or they got actually PCI. But uh, in terms of the long-term actually follow-up, uh, they did pretty actually good. Uh, no matter what treatment option they went through, they did pretty actually good. Uh, many of them they presented with actually a STEMI, non-STEMI, a couple of them only on a cerebral angina chest pain. So, uh, again, really kind of a sick population of a scalp patient. Um, if you make the right decision, I think long-term prognosis can be very good for these patients. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, they will suffer a lot of other things, being on top, anxiety and depression. So, you know, as a doctor taking care of this patient, you have to be ready to deal with other aspects of the medical care for this patient. So, just to summarize, you know, recap, uh, you know, a couple of things I really want you to leave with, um, now going from this uh, presentation, is when you see a young lady, especially younger than 58 year old, coming with any sort of MI, and to make it even broader, any, like, chest pain or kind of a concerning symptom that can be cardiovascular, just think of a SCAD. Again, like anything else, you have to think of it to be able to diagnose. Of course, traditional risk factor may not be present in a SCAD. Maybe, but may not be. So that's another actually uh, way for you to think a little bit higher than, uh, for a SCAD than uh, usual atherosclerosis. Again, if there's no evidence of atherosclerosis in that vessel that you see the little intima tearing or whatnot, or the other arteries, think of a scab. Prepartum state, of course, as we uh, repeated actually many, many times. FMD, another uh, thing that you'll basically see more, and uh, again, it will, uh, hopefully diagnose patients with this condition um, to kind of warn them about what may happen also. Connective tissue disorder, recent intensive exercise, emotional stress, all of this, they can lead actually to a scab. Just think of them. Many, many websites have been developed for SCAD patients. They develop themselves. They develop with Mayo Clinic, other places to get help, information. Again, it's a disease that is not affecting just one person. It's going to be, you know, the whole family involved, usually young patients. You know, you go to their room. These are the patients that they have, like, 10 family members in the room, half crying. I mean, it's very, you know, it can be an um, overwhelming condition to deal with for the patient, for the medical team, and for the family. So SCAD is an infrequent cause of ACS, but not as rare as previously thought, especially if you think of it, look for it. Most common cause of prepartum acute coronary syndrome, as I said, almost half of these patients with prepartum ACS, they have a SCAD. Natural history, remember, is healing, uh, but it can be a bad disease. It can be fatal. Uh, FMD, intense exercise, emotional stress, among other associated factors. Remember, like anything else in medicine, you are not alone, you know. Get the heart team approach, multidisciplinary approach. Challenging cases require, you know, you to be ready, your team to be ready, and use your resources to uh, do what is best for your patient. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, that's fantastic. I think we'll think of SCAT. Um, we have time for questions. Dr. Spot? So, uh, obviously, women are in the council not become pregnant in the registry. How do you put 
Very good question. So really, I don't think um, any of the registries, there's no high prevalence, like it is not 30, 40% risk for subsequent pregnancy associated with SCAD, but uh, definitely actually lower numbers I've seen. I don't remember the exact number, but it's not very high. But it just makes total sense to advise the patient against. Uh, second question, um, so that lady going back, uh, so she, uh, first time actually, we don't know if she had a troponin or not, it was many, many years ago, and they did um, suggested her to get a cornea angiogram. So I assume that she did have something serious going on. Second time around, she did have a coronary CTA, which we reviewed. There was no evidence of a scar or any atherosclerotic lesion. But again, remember, coronary CTA is not as good as uh, invasive angiogram to diagnose. My personal feeling is that patient was kind of lucky, honestly. I mean, she got a couple of times maybe warning, and so a third time it was a big proxial AD lesion. She did very, very well, but things could be very bad. So. And remember, I remember actually at the time I was talking with our surgeon about this patient, and he just actually told me he had a similar case about a couple of months ago and uh, didn't do very well. So, I mean, this can be very, very tough patient, so uh, just be ready for it. So one of your slides had a reference from circulation, and the first author was Tweet. Have you shared that on social media, that paper? <laughs> <laughs> might be a good idea. No, I haven't seen. I haven't seen any relationship between coin and scan. Could pick up antibiotics. I haven't seen. Usually, those are older folks with underlying antibiotics. Yeah, I don't know. Is it because of again MMPs or they're messing up the XSL matrix or not? But I haven't seen uh, coin alones uh, with a scan. Definitely, a steroid have been suggested for the reasons we talked about. Great. Um, thanks again. I think we of course, my pleasure. <laughs> Yeah. No, so it was actually...